good day. So, in the last lecture we discussed about uh, IP version 4 that is the uh, version of the internet protocol which is now uh, I mean ubiquitous in the sense that almost everywhere it is used. But this particular version I mean as it became uh, wildly popular more popular than its originator thought. Uh, then some problems about IPv4 came into uh, uh, focus and uh, people started discussing about that what is the next generation of uh, uh, internet protocol that is uh, that would be there and after a lot of discussion etcetera people came up with this IP version 6. So, we will be um, doing a little uh, discussion on IP version 6 today and in the later part of the lecture we will be talking about mobile IP. So, first about IP version 6. So, what were the design goal? As I mentioned IPv4 was very successful, but the limited addresses posed uh, problems uh, because I mean and this was discussed earlier how people are uh, I mean trying to fight with this problem using natting and all these things uh, uh, because the uh, I mean so many machines are uh, coming into the network these days and not only machines people are actually I mean talking about and actually deploying in some cases all kinds of other gadgets which should be connected to the network. Now, if some uh, thing is to be connected to the network which is to be accessed from anywhere uh, on the internet uh, then it has to have an IP address and the pool of IP address that we have in IPv4 is very limited. So, that was a major problem that IPv4 uh, it has limited addresses. And second problem this was also mentioned earlier that the routing information were not inherent in addresses. Okay. Say for example, in a, in a postal address okay, we get got the pin code. So, if in the in the pin code if the first digit is 7 immediately you know it is towards the east, if the first digit is 1 immediately you know that it is towards the north. So, just by looking at that you can <coughs> simply uh, I mean send the um, whatever parcel or uh, postage whatever to that direction. But uh, that is not so that has not been so because these IP addresses although they were based on networks which are larger chunk than hosts they were distributed, uh, but then uh, uh, this could not be maintained at that time. So, if uh, you could have some uh, way of geographical um, information is inbuilt into it then routing becomes easier uh, and the routing table becomes smaller. If the routing table is smaller routing speed becomes faster and so there are so many advantages. And then thirdly experience had shown that some aspects of IPv4 were problematic uh, like option headers and for, uh, fragments etcetera these were problematic. Then there were some type of service which people never never used options also has very limited utility because of its limited size and fragments of course, was a problem. So, these were the uh, basic issues. So, the simplification for IPv6 that were mentioned one was that to move to a 128 bit address. Okay. Now, 128 bits from 32 bits uh, if you remember that IPv4 has a um, listing of the has an address size of 32 bits whereas, this is 128 bit. So, in IPv4 in a theoretical maximum is 2 to the power 32 of course, it is less than that, but anyway the theoretical maximum is 2 to the power 32 addresses whereas, here it is 2 to the power 128 addresses which is a very huge huge number. Okay. Even if all the devices that you can think of and all the computers that you can think of are connected they can all be given individual address space and then also you will have a huge number of addresses to spare. So, this was done with the idea that uh, we are not going to run into this problem of limited address space uh, uh, soon or ever. <coughs> the other uh, point is of course, if you have so many bits uh, as I said that even after assigning numbers to all the devices and computers you will have left uh, be left with some to spare. So, that can be used more intelligently. Then the second point was to assign a fixed format to all headers. Okay. Now, IPv4 also the essential part of it the uh, initial part of it the compulsory part of it is fixed, okay. but the but that but then there are options and these options could be of various sizes. So, you have so that is also removed remove the header checksum which was not doing much anyway 
and use extension headers rather than options. So, options were removed and we came to the concept of extension header that means headers followed by other headers we will come to this later on and remove hop by hop segmentation procedure that means you do not segment somewhere in between a packet is traveling and then uh, somewhere in between you try to fragment it uh, that is uh, that, that was not a good idea okay because uh, because of this fragmentation you had to keep the uh, fragmentation number and uh, uh, this identification packet identification and so on and so forth so all this is removed okay although fragmentation can be handled in some way uh, so we will talk about that later so, this was the original IPv4 header which we have already discussed like version, header length, type of service etcetera. This type of service was not very useful, fragments etcetera came in because of um, we allowed fragmentation which we do not hear, header checksum may go out, of course the source and destination IP addresses would be there. Uh, so, let us come to the IPv6 header. So, you see IPv6 header is actually much simpler than the IPv4 headers. Okay. We have a few fields here and then the source address. So, assuming that this is 32. So, previously this uh, I, previous IPv4 address was only one line. Now, you have four lines that means 128 bits for source address and 128 bit for destination address. So, let us look at the fields. One is the version number previously it was 4 now it is 6. Class this is used for uh, to assign service class for real time networking. So, if you are doing some real time networking that can be indicated here. Then there is a uh, field called flow if you just quickly look at it we have version class flow level. So, what is a flow? Flow means uh, given uh, one particular uh, source and another destination for this particular source and destination pair there is a source uh, there is a flow level. Uh, the idea is that in the intermediate routers uh, because uh, flow means that means uh, these two are likely to send a large number of packets and uh, all of them would belong to the same flow. Uh, this is not a virtual circuit identifier like ATM because in ATM the virtual circuit identifier an intermediate switch would just look at the virtual circuit identifier and switch it that way it is not for that purpose at all. Uh, this is for uh, treating the uh, packets in a with a particular flow level from a particular uh, source and destination in the same way uh, I mean all packets belonging to the same flow level in the similar way in the intermediate router. For example, there may be uh, <coughs> class of uh, uh, service or all kinds of quality of service uh, requirements for one particular flow which may require let us say bandwidth reservation in between. So, such things can be handled using the flow level. Next is the payload length only include the payload not the 20 byte header uh, this is 16 bits uh, for that. So, packets are once again less than equal to 64 k. Next header, so this gives the rise to the possibility uh, that there may be more than one header if there are not any more than uh, uh, if there are not any more IPv6 header then at least the higher uh, layer um, header like TCP or UDP uh, uh, headers could be there. Then there is a field called hop limit this is really the TTL that is time to leave which was there earlier in um, IPv4, but was used uh, just uh, to keep the count of the hop. So, this is just renamed for honesty as hop limit. And then now about fragments. One of the lessons we learned, learned in IPv4 was that the unit of transmission should be the unit of control. So, no fragments created en route in IPv6. If message is greater than MTU uh, that is the maximum transferable unit you get ICMP message which is an uh, internet control uh, message protocol. So, we will talk a little bit more about ICMP later on, but this is some kind of control message which may be sent by a router to host etcetera. So, an ICMP message and uh, should use the uh, path M to you. I um, will just uh, tell you quickly what is meant by this M to you and path M to you and how do we avoid uh, transmission. What you do is that suppose you are uh, suppose you are the source you want to transmit a particular packet. It so happens that on uh, en route it encountered a link where this such a big packet cannot be accommodated. So, what the in IPv6 what this router will do is that it will drop the packet and send back an ICMP message 
saying that this uh, MPU is so much, MPU for the next link that is. So now you reduce your packet size at the source itself and try to send it again. If it now it will definitely cross that particular link, it may get uh, stuck again in another link. So again an ICMP message will come back, but finally you will come to the come to an uh, size uh, of packet which will go through all the links. Now this is your path MPU. Now and then now you can send uh, go on sending uh, your uh, all your communication using this particular packet length and it will not be fragmented uh, in between. So, however, uh, there is a so there is a this is a way to fragment a datagram, but it is done in an end to end fashion. It may so happen that a some particular application uh, uh, all these packet uh, I mean smaller packets now we have made should actually be made into a bigger packet. So, this is a uh, fragment in some sense so far as the uh, fragmentation in some sense so far as the application uh, layer is concerned. So, there is a way to indicate that. So, there is a header for that. And finally, uh, we have removed the options from the IPv4 header and we have come to this extension headers. That means, there may be more than one header. So, we could have this situation that IPv6 header and next header is said to be TCP. So, the payload is the TCP header and payload. It could be that IPv6 header next header is a routing header which is again an extension header for IPv6. So, routing header next header is TCP. So, the TCP header and payload comes here. So, there may be more than one IPv6 headers and headers are of different types. So, we will come to that here. The idea is to intermediate routers do not need to look at the uh, at the headers unless we tell them to. So, there are some headers which it um, needs to look into, there are some other headers it need not look into it. So, that it does not need to process all the information, it should be fast. Extension headers and protocols, for example, TCP share the same 256 entry namespace, 256 entry namespace for the headers. So, uh, so there are limited number of extensions are there, but I think this number is uh, big enough. So, there is a certain order in which these uh, headers are uh, it is suggested that these headers should occur in this particular order. One is IPv6 header the main header that we talked about an extension header called hop by hop header, uh, next destination options header, routing header, fragment header, authentication header, destination options header upper layer headers if any that means TCP or UDP. I will just I mean quickly discuss just a few of them. So, you see your payload may be encapsulated thus, it is a payload followed by the transport layer header that is a TCP, then routing header, authentication header, another two routing headers, then an IP header and so on. So, what you do is that you peel them one by one, so one routing header is peeled off. Uh, because this routing header as you might imagine the routing header gives you information about how to route the packet something like source routing. Uh, so, that is peeled off in the maybe in the next hop and this uh, goes out the IP header remains and the routing header authentication all these other header remains. So, like just like peeling onions you peel out one header after another and finally, uh, you get to the uh, TCP and the payload. Now, just a little uh, this thing about the names as uh, we have mentioned that this has got a very large address space, a large part of the address space is unassigned, okay. which means that at this point of time people thought it prudent to keep provision for some future requirement which we cannot envisage at this moment. Okay. So, a large part of the namespace has simply been kept unassigned okay. and then there, uh, there is a way now to move away from provider based routing uh, based IDs, although both are uh, two routing based IDs, although both are possible. This means that I mean previously what would happen is that a service provider would uh, take a chunk of uh, IP addresses, it is for his network. Okay. Now, his network for a service provider of may be distributed in various places. So, this loses the if you uh, give it an, uh, provider wise this loses the uh, destination information. Whereas, if you had done it geographically, uh, so that the routing would be much easier. So, routing table will also be smaller. IPv6 
sorry gives the option of both okay so you can have provider based out uh, provider based addresses of course but, but you can also have geography based up, uh, addresses and there are various levels of aggregation like top level aggregation this is essentially a hierarchical organization reflecting the current internet architecture then you have the next level aggregator then a site level aggregator allocated to a link or a link level or site level aggregator which is very local which means that Mm, at the link or the site level, uh, so the rest of it may be common, okay, does not matter because it is strictly for local uh, use, uh, something similar to a private IP you might say uh, and not for uh, communication with others. The interface ID is based on UID, the extension of the Ethernet MAC address. <coughs> so that also can be embedded. Then there are some unspecified addresses, we need not bother about all this uh, because uh, IPv6 as yet has not been deployed much. Only thing I would uh, like uh, to uh, point out this last point is about any cast. We have uh, talked about broadcast, multicast, uh, sorry unicast, broadcast and multicast. Anycast is a concept which is something similar to uh, multicast. But in multicast there is a group, you want to uh, send the, some message to all the members of the group. In any cast, you want to send the message to any member of the group. So that is an any cast. So just a quick look at um, some of the uh, extension headers, routing extension headers. So it can the next header, a header uh, length, a routing type, etc. We need not bother about the details. Then now we have some address 1 to address n. There are some, uh, some uh, IP addresses, IPv6 addresses may be listed over here. So it plays the same role as source routing header. Okay. Uh, you remember that there in the in IPv4 options there is a uh, way to give the um, uh, routing from the source. That means you determine the routing from the source itself. Uh, such a facility is very important for protocols like BGP because BGP wants to dictate uh, the route through which his uh, packet should be uh, routed. But the uh, uh, problem with IPv4 was that uh, the, uh, the header length was very limited. So you can go only up to maybe a dozen or so but maybe 12 to 15 hops in the source route. Be, if, if it is beyond 12 to 15 hops, you, I mean you would run out of space in the header, so you would not be able to uh, specify that. Here that uh, because uh, you can have a routing header, then you can have more than one routing headers. All right. So here this uh, particular um, difficulty is obviated. So basic idea when a datagram reaches a destination, the destination checks for a routing header. If there is at least one segment left, that address is copied from the routing header and the packet is forwarded to that address. Otherwise, the routing header is removed and the next routing header is processed. You can have multiple routing headers if the 8 bit header length causes a problem. There is a header length of 8 bits, so you can go up to a length of <coughs> 256, but then you can have multiple routing headers. You can specify other source routing nodes using type. Then fragment header, each fragment routed independently. Uh, so, identification identifies the original packet that was fragmented, the offset is the offset within the fragment, the M field is a more fragments bit is set to 1 for all but last fragment. So, this is exactly similar to the way uh, fragmentation uh, was uh, um, handled in IPv4. The difference over here is that uh, the source sends it using the path MTU, that means it is the, the in between it is not fragmented whatever fragmentation is done is done at the source and that information is carried in one header called this uh, fragment header and uh, but those who need not fragment anything uh, they will not use this header. So all these extension headers are optional, <coughs> you have to have of course have to have the first IPv6 header but all the extension headers are optional. If so if you are not fragmenting then you will not, you will not use this header. Then there is a destination option header. When a packet reaches its final destination or at least when all prior routing extensions have been processed, the destination options header is processed. 
So, unknown options are optionally discarded. So, hop, uh, so that is a, a process at the destination, hop by hop op options header, this is the other one. A destination a extension header is looked at at the end, at the destination. In the hop by hop, all these intermediate hops, at intermediate hops, you need to look at this hop by hop uh, options header. So, uh, they are processed at each hop. Example, for example, jumbo payload header, the IP header length is 0 and the jumbo option encodes the true length as a 32 bit value. So, this is an option that you can have a very big packet traveling down it. So, also used to mark spanning trees for multicast and real time protocols etcetera. So, you may there may be things that you need to do uh, at every hop. <coughs> then security was also thought about. So, security association we will talk uh, about network security etcetera at length later on. So, I will just skim over this at the moment. Uh, so, this, uh, but there is a way to put authentication and encryption requires that senders and receivers agree on a key for encryption and decryption and authentication or encryption algorithm and set of ancillary parameters such as the lifetime etcetera. So, this is called a security association. Now, you have an authentication header where the security parameters may be mentioned, sequence, sequence number field next header length and result. So, the SPI is selected by the receiver and is used to describe the security association that means all these key uh, these all these other things that are normally negotiated during the key exchange. And then there is an encrypted security payload. So, this is the I of course, your header all these headers cannot be encrypted because in that case the intermediate uh, routers uh, will not be able to handle it. So, the last unencrypted header in the chain. So, this is the um, which is uh, says that this is an encrypted uh, security. So, there will be encrypted data and authentication data and uh, ESP encrypted security payload header ESP header will be there. So, ESP header also includes authentication to prevent tampering with encrypted data. So, we will talk in details about security in a later lecture. Okay. So, uh, actually uh, just uh, to conclude this uh, discussion about IPv6. Uh, so, this uh, the, so a lot of thought went into it. So, people thought about it and this is really uh, uh, one scheme where people will not be uh, running out of IP addresses. Okay. <coughs> so, that was there. Uh, and then uh, a funny thing happened in the sense that many of the hardware vendors like uh, routers etcetera, uh, they uh, sort of modified their design so that they can handle uh, IPv6. But actually what happened was that everybody is waiting for all others to jump into the fray to switch from IPv4 to IPv6. Because of course, I mean when you switch, uh, you may have uh, problems with uh, some of your software or a lot of your software actually. Okay. So, that is why nobody and of course, yeah, I mean if you only switch that will not do because the rest of the world will still go with IPv4. You can still operate it through some bridge etcetera, through an IPv4, IPv6 etcetera, but, uh, but then nobody wants to do it unless other people are doing it and then the, and that is how everybody is held back for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, but uh, one thing that is said that if there are ubiquitous uh, kind of uh, networking in the sense that all your devices, not only your computers, but all your devices like your refrigerator, TV and uh, uh, air conditioner and everything in the house, so if that gets networked, then it will require a huge number of network addresses. Then people will not have any option, but to actually make the move. Okay. So, right now everybody is sort of waiting for other people to make the move. Next, we will uh, come to this topic of uh, mobile IP. Now, what is mobile IP? Mobile IP means that now there are many network attachable devices, not to talk about uh, just laptop computers which people are carrying anyway. And even apart from laptop computers, there can be all kinds of devices including handheld devices which can be connected to a network. All right. Now, what is the problem if these all these mobile devices are connected to the network? Uh, there are no problem as such, whenever you go there have to be some kind of some way in which a physical connection is made that connection may be wireless in the case of mobile and uh, this thing wireless connection is very attractive. Uh, 
otherwise you may go to some other place and actually connect a wire over there. So, it may be wired also, although wireless is more dominant, but the trouble is what happens to the IP address. You have a particular or your device has a particular IP address and that was may have worked fine when we were at your home base, but you have moved from your home base to some other place. Now, if somebody wants to talk to you, he will be using your IP address that is what is known to him. For example, <coughs> to all the name servers etcetera, we will talk about name servers later, we will have the IP address uh, if you are, <coughs> if you have a URL. Uh, correspond, uh, an IP address corresponding to a URL that is not going to change. So, they are going to try to uh, use your old IP address, but using your old IP address they will land up in your home base, home network, you are no longer in your home network. So, that is the problem of mobile IP that means, how when a particular network attached device is moved uh, or it moves from one network or one sub network to another network, uh, how do you uh, keep on communicating. So, that is the problem of mobile IP. So, this is these are the problems as I discuss just now discussed nodes in the internet are identified by specified IP address. Routing is performed using that same IP address. When a node's location or attachment changes routing will not work with the same IP address that is the simple uh, point. The node must change its, so what are the alternatives? One is that the node must change its IP address whenever it changes its point of attachment. So, it requires upper level protocols to handle address changes that is one problem that means where it will is not going to be, I mean if it is to be made automatic then it has to be made automated by a higher layer protocol which really sort of violates this uh, layered architecture that is one point. Uh, more importantly what would happen as I just now mentioned that other people would who wants to communicate would, with you know your IP address. So, they do not know that it has changed in the meanwhile. So, they would still be try to communicate with the old IP address. The other thing was that host specific routes uh, must be propagated through the network. This is another possibility uh, because from your IP address if somebody is trying to contact you from outside he first looks at the network part of the address and lets up in your network. Then within the network of course, you have this ARP and other protocols to help you to get the MAC address and uh, reach you directly. Now, if the routes were in the routing table, so the routing table essentially keeps track of all the networks okay, as many as they can depending on what size of router it is. The big routers uh, take keep track of many networks, the small routers keep track of only a few network addresses. Now, if there, uh, these uh, entries were against hosts, then of course, the routers might dynamically change their entry etcetera and route it directly to that host. Okay. But even handling so many millions of networks is becoming a problem, so handling billions of hosts in the routers is simply out of question. So, what the solution to this is to use another level of indirection that is what we do in mobile IP as I will just now show. So, mobile IP design goals a mobile node must be able to communicate with other nodes after changing its link layer attachment. That means, is changing its link layer attachment means changing the attachment to the network or sub network to which it was originally attached, yet without changing its IP address, its IP address remains the same. So, this is the problem. A mobile node must be able to communicate with other nodes that do not implement mobile IP, this is the other requirement. That means, that you may do something uh, very uh, sophisticated and special in your handheld device, but the point is that it still must be able to communicate with millions of uh, um, other hosts uh, for whom, uh, I mean who do not implement any special, uh, who do not have any special arrangement for communicating with mobile IP. So, you cannot do anything on the other end. The another point is that this is a sort of security um, concern and that a mobile IP must use authentication to offer security against redirectment attacks. The point is that uh, when you are um, in your same network, okay, you can try to uh, sort of authenticate yourself I mean apart from any other uh, security arrangement that may be there like your let us say your password etcetera etcetera the, which may be there at a higher layer, uh, but the point is it is also possible uh, to see that okay, I, I allow communication with that 
particular host which is in that network. So, I will set up my firewall or router policy in such a way that uh, that particular communication would be allowed, maybe communication from others will not be allowed. So, this could be a security this thing. But the point is if that fellow has moved to another network, I will not be able to do it using the um, <coughs> Mm, network address that is one aspect and the other point is that other people may fake from other places that he is actually uh, uh, suppose I want to communicate with Mr. X some Mr. Y from some other place may sort of try to uh, uh, spoof in the sense they may try to uh, show that he is actually Mr. X. So, I will think that I will um, communicating with Mr. X, but actually I am communicating with Mr. Y. So, such all kinds of possibilities are there. So, I will not go into the detail. So, that security concern is also there. And the number of administrative messages should be small to save bandwidth and power. So, you cannot uh, have a huge overhead for doing this. So, mobile IP must impose no additional constraint on the assignment of IP addresses. This is another important issue. Now, I will before uh, describing how this mobile IP is implemented, I will just uh, um, talk about some terminology. One is a mobile node, which is a host or router that changes its point of attachment from one network or sub network to another. Uh, so, a mobile node may change its location without changing its IP address. It may continue to communicate with other internet nodes at any location using its own constant IP address. So, that is good home agent. Now, this is something new and this is required for uh, uh, in order to support mobile IP. So, a home agent is a router on a mobile node's home network that tunnels datagrams to the mobile node when it is away from home. So, uh, so you can uh, uh, I mean immediately get the idea how it is done. The point is that uh, I mean this particular mobile uh, device has a home network and that home network has a router and let us say that supports uh, mobile IP. So, what uh, that home network router would do is that, uh, so whatever communication is uh, supposed to be received by this particular uh, uh, mobile device that will be uh, that will come to its home network. So, the router over there will uh, sort of accept that communication on behalf of this uh, mobile host who may now be away somewhere else. And then it would be the job of the router to send that communication back to that uh, particular uh, mobile uh, host. And not only you require a home agent, that means some router which is who is helping you and your home network, you also require a foreign agent, a router on a mobile node's visited network, that means the network to which it is currently connected physically, that provides routing services to the mobile node while registered. But of course, for getting this service, you must register with this foreign agent. <coughs> uh, the mobile node is assigned a care of address. So, now this is a new address. One is the mobile node's own IP address, which is remaining constant, which is actually belongs to the network uh, in his home base. But it is also got a care of address on the foreign network. This address is used to deliver the datagram for the mobile node. This can either be the foreign agent, that means the foreign agent's address may be its care of address or it can be co-located with the mobile node. So, that is also possible. So, this is uh, the idea you have uh, as I mentioned that this is the home network of the device of A. A of course, has now moved to another network. So, this is the visited network of A. In the home network, A has a home agent who will help you in this mobile communication. In the visited network, it looks for and finds a foreign agent who will help you with the for this communication. This foreign agent will give that care of address and that is they are all both of them are suppose connected to the internet. So, suppose some source wants to send something to A. So, naturally he will use A's original IP address. So, it will be routed to the home network of A. What will happen is that then the home network will send it to the home agent and the home agent knows uh, that uh, the A is no longer here, A is somewhere else and A he also knows the uh, care of address for this uh, given by this foreign agent. So, he tunnels the communication to the foreign agent using that care of address and the foreign agent will deliver the message to A because foreign agent knows the A's 
current location, MAC address, etc., it knows. So, it can communicate. Now, A replies to C, but this can go straight. You see, this need not go in the circuitous manner from the, because he is using the um, um, IP address of this source of the original communication. So, A can send this reply directly back to the source. So, this need not go through all this. So, this is the solution in a nutshell. So, from the source it goes to the home agent, to the foreign agent, to the node and from the node it directly goes back to the source for the return communication. Just a little overview of the uh, protocol, you have advertisement that means mobile agents, uh, um, foreign agents and home agents should advertise their services. That means, uh, the some mobile ho node, uh, so that the mobile node comes to know that this um, foreign agent or home agent is available, this service is available. Or otherwise, if they are not, I mean a mobile node can also solicit for mobility agents, that is also possible. Registration, when a mobile node is away from home, it must register its care of address with its home agent. So, not only it must uh, talk to the, uh, I mean set up with a foreign agent, some arrangement with the foreign agent to give it an uh, address, that address has to be sent to the home agent. So, that whatever the home agent tunnels, it will tunnel straight to the, uh, to that care of address. Delivering datagrams, datagrams must be forwarded by the home agent to the foreign agent for delivery to the care of address. The delivery mechanism must handle all packets including broadcast and multicast. A tunnel is used for this and I will just show you what a tunnel means <coughs> just little later. Advertisement and solicitation, the router discovery ICMP protocol was adapted for advertisement and solicitation. So, there was not much change was required. We will look at details of ICMP protocol later. The routers broadcast or multicast every few seconds. So, uses limited broadcast or all systems on this link multicast kind of uh, this thing address for um, uh, giving this, because uh, they cannot use the um, IP address directly, because it is an advertisement. Mobile nodes also send out solicitation messages, which will cause a router to broadcast or multicast their advertisement. Registration, request forwarding services when visiting a foreign network. This allocates a local foreign node address, that means that care of address is required. Inform home agent of their current care of address. This creates a binding of the foreign node address to the home address in the home agent. So, that if anything comes uh, with the original home address, uh, I mean destined for the original home address, this can be tunneled to the care of address. And just this is one small but important point that this binding has to be renewed uh, from time to time. Okay. Bindings have lifetimes, this is important because a mobile um, node may be rude and just go away without informing anybody and that registration will uh, sort of last forever. So, it cannot last forever, so it is best that it dies down after some time. If the mobile agent continues in the same location for more time, it is going to renew this uh, binding from time to time. And of course, you have to deregister when they return home. Tunneling, there are various methods of tunneling. Uh, so, we will just discuss this IP and IP capsulation and minimal encapsulation. This is IP in IP. <coughs> so, this was the original message which was sent from the uh, source and which landed in the um, uh, home network of the uh, destination. If you remember the diagram, the destination was uh, mentioned as A. So, this is the, or, uh, so this IP header will contain the uh, actual home address of A and this is the datagram. So, what it does is when it uh, uh, lands into the home agent, the home agent knows that this has to be sent somewhere else, it keeps the inner IP header and datagram intact. So, this whole thing is considered now as a payload and then you add another IP header with some options if necessary and this IP header will have as its destination the tunnel endpoints, that tunnel destination that means that care of address. So, now this packet would be, uh, so actually 
in the packet the original packet is still there this inner IP header and the datagram etc that is still there. So, this whole thing is encapsulated as if this is a payload and sent to the uh, foreign network in the care of address at the so it will reach the foreign agent and the foreign agent will then um, send it send this part to the uh, mobile node who is correctly connected and its MAC address is known to the foreign agent. The mobile agent would uh, or the mobile node will receive a whole packet including this inner IP header. So, you do not require any kind of change in the software which handles it just like a normal packet. I mean it is as if he was in the home network and got this original packet. So, the outer IP header source and destination address identify the tunnel endpoints. Uh, so, the source would be the home agent and the destination would be the foreign agent. The outer protocol is 4 that is the IP protocol. The inner IP header source address and destination address identify the original sender and recipient. So, this is not changed by the encapsulator except to change the time to leave. Time to leave of course, you will have to look at the uh, TTL and then make necessary changes. So, this whole thing is uh, put in the payload. Other headers for authentication might be added to the outer header uh, in order to handle all these uh, security concerns. Some outer IP header fields are copied from the inner IP fields for example, <coughs> type of service etcetera most are recomputed like checksum, checksum length, uh, length etcetera they may change based on the new datagram. The other option is the minimal encapsulation. Minimal encapsulation uh, uh, means that uh, that you do not keep the entire um, IP header intact in the this thing. So, what you want to do is that you want to uh, I mean just retain the minimal information in the minimal header and then construct an outer IP header. So, outer IP header of course, the tunnel endpoints as the source and destination address would still be there and uh, some of the message uh, some of the stuff from the IP header will also come here and this will contain the uh, minimal uh, this things the destination address would be there in the minimal header. So, you have to uh, make some um, uh, deconstruction and reconstruction at both places the size is a bit smaller. So, the overhead may be a bit smaller, but it may not be such a big deal. So, in minimal encapsulation we copy inner header modify protocol field to be 55 for the minimal encapsulation protocol because on the other side it must know which protocol it is following. If it is following minimal encapsulation then it has to do something. Destination address is replaced by the tunnel exit. If encapsulated is not the originator of message replace source address with address of encapsulator and increment total length by the size of the additional header either 12 or 8 octets and then recompute the checksum. So, this is one way this is uh, called mobile IP in the one way in which uh, uh, mobility can be handled and your IP address can be uh, uh, recomputed all right. There are of course, uh, I mean other possibilities and other ways of handling mobility. Uh, for example, uh, just like when you are I mean this of course, has an overhead that any communication from the source to the um, intended host who has moved now has to go through this triangular path. There is a question that it will will it continue to do so or whether after first communication they would uh, there will be some protocol to exchange their two uh, new IP addresses etcetera and then they can communicate directly that would avoid this triangular path. The other problems with triangular path may be apart from higher overhead what it may be that it may exceed the hop limit okay. uh, as networks are growing that it may incre increase the hop limit and you may never reach whereas, if it had gone directly then it would could have reached. Other option could be just like you do cellular uh, handoffs in a cellular from one base station to another uh, you see uh, uh, when uh, in the case of cellular networks what is happening is that uh, you are always um, uh, in connection with some base station maybe even one more than one base station and you are moving away from one base station when the 
signal strength falls it goes to the realm of another base station the another base station automatically picks up and sort of does some kind of registration and when that is done the communication remains direct but in order to do this so but if you want to change the ip address in such a dynamic fashion then there has to be an integrated uh, uh, system running everywhere uh, which is uh, which is using this protocol so mobile ip is a way of handling mobility with minimal uh, kind of change to others but of course it has the problem that uh, this has a um, this has a uh, significant overhead okay thank you <coughs> so in the next uh, class we will be moving into the next higher layer uh, which is the transport uh, protocol uh, transport layer that is the tcp and uh, udp thank you good day uh, today we will uh, start our discussion about proto uh, transport layer protocols uh, and the, there are actually two dominant protocols udp and tcp so we will take them up one by one udp in this lecture and tcp in the next one so uh, this is udp it uh, actually stands for user datagram protocol okay so this is a transport layer protocol and this has got the following responsibilities first of all it creates a process to process communication path okay so till now we have uh, talked about the um, network layer and the network layer the job of the network layer is to connect a distant machine to another distant machine so it's a machine to machine communication whereas now we are talking about uh, process to process communication so in this particular machine in the source machine maybe some process is running some application process which is trying to connect to this other distant machine uh, for some job so this process has to connect to a, the corresponding process there that may be a particular application server on one side and that application client on the other side whatever that application may be so this is a process to process communication path and then this also is has to provide control mechanisms at the transport level and of course this control mechanism in the case of udp is very minimal as we will presently see so uh, this uh, this is a connectionless now this udp is a connectionless unreliable transport protocol okay now uh, of course immediately the question would uh, uh, come in your mind is that why would we uh, try to uh, have an unreliable protocol a protocol which is unreliable well this is not unreliable per se the point is it does not do anything extra for reliability making it a very lightweight protocol so this is uh, so this overhead its cost is uh, very s low so in many cases that may be a very um, reasonable thing to have where you do not expect a lot of errors or you do not really care if uh, some error occurs from time to time so in such cases you may use udp so this is a and this is a connection less protocol more about that later it only adds process to process communication to ip performs very limited error checking as we have as mentioned and very simple protocol has minimal overhead this is the main point it has got very minimal overhead forms the uh, payload for the next layer that is the ip layer and the checksum is computed over this entire body and that is so it also carries so there is some amount of error checking and error detection that is done uh, right now we are talking about udp so it is done by uh, udp and that is the extent to which it will go for providing reliability beyond this if the entire packet is lost somewhere uh, the udp cannot do anything about it so these are the four uh, fields of the header um, uh, source port number destination port number total length and the checksum and uh, regarding the udp operation this is a connectionless service this has very minimal flow and error control as given by the checksum it does the encapsulation and decapsulation forming of packets gives us some queuing and does the multiplexing and demultiplexing so let us look at these operations uh, one by one <coughs> this is a connectionless service 
that means each user datagram sent is an independent datagram all right uh, which means that suppose some particular application has sent one udp and is going to send another one now these uh, the uh, i mean layers below below this application they may be uh, coming from the same uh, source uh, application process destined for the same destination application process uh, so these two uh, these two da datagrams but they are going to be treated independently by the rest of the network layers and hence the network now this means uh, uh, a number of things first of all it may so happen that one of uh, these two packets may go in two different uh, directions may be routed differently okay because there is no connection this is a completely uh, datagram oriented service connectionless service so these two datagrams may travel different paths secondly one of them may get lost of course uh, thirdly what might happen is um, that uh, they may go out of order okay the uh, datagram which was sent earlier may uh, go there later on and and so on and uh, the point is that for all these mishaps udp is not going to take any responsibility it is uh, it is taken for granted that whatever application is using this udp is resilient to uh, such things happening so there is no relationship between different user datagrams and the user datagrams are not numbered meaning that uh, when the um, late uh, datagram which was sent later it if it arrives earlier and vice versa uh, there is no way of knowing unless of course the kind the application layer itself you have taken some uh, care to identify that so it's a connect so no connection establishment since there is a completely a <coughs> connection less service so there is no question of any connection establishment and since there is no connection establishment there is no connection termination either these are unregulated which means that from uh, up to 1000 uh, port number 1023 these are reserved and that is also again divided into two parts one part for the public applications and the other for some uh, um, maybe vendor specific applications but they are all well known port numbers now think of the uh, uh, other direction apart from well known um, uh, port numbers you also need a whole lot of other uh, port numbers uh, say uh, take the previous example that you have made an http request to a web server now the web server will uh, will send you back something okay will send you back with a reply maybe uh, it will be send you with the content of the uh, opening uh, the first uh, page of its uh, website <laughs> opening page of its website that is going to be sent to the requester but to which port now for this uh, a, um, another port number is uh, temporarily assigned and this is assigned from a number range from 1024 to uh, that 65000 all right so they say a number is randomly chosen so this is an ephemeral port this is not a fixed port so for the duration of this communication this port number is going to be held uh, constant and then it will be released for use by some other process. So source port numbers are dynamically assigned by the originating host and are usually a number larger than 1023. Port numbers in the range of 0 to 1023 are controlled by IANA. So these are some examples of some uh, well known port numbers uh, these i mean there are uh, uh, quite a good number of them but i have just mentioned some uh, important uh, protocols for example ftp which is a file transfer protocol this uses port number 21 telnet which is a terminal connection which is a port number 23 by the way i will be talking uh, more about these app some of these application layer protocols in a, a later lecture some of them i mean there are many many uh, i mean nowadays there are hundreds of applications have come up uh, so we cannot talk about all of them but we will talk about a few of them um, towards the uh, last part of our course <coughs> so uh, for the time being let me just mention them telnet is a terminal connection which uses the well known port number 23 smtp which is a simple mail transfer uh, protocol uses port number 25 TFTP trivial file transfer when you just have to send a short message um, that uses 69 
HTTP which is the hypertext transfer protocols which is the one is used for web services that uses port number well known port number 80. POP 3 which is a post office protocol uh, uses the port number 110. What POP 3 does is that suppose you got a uh, you got some mail in your mailbox in, in the server in the local mail server then on your desktop you can download all the mails from the local server to your machine through the post office protocol this is the pop 3 protocol this type of server is called concurrent now uh, this is what happens uh, in the uh, i mean just to elaborate on the server part a little bit more than what i have already discussed the client request for a connection uh, has uh, come to the server. Now what might happen is that the server after all what is a server? In this case when I mention the term server I mean that software process which is running there not the hardware box. A hardware box is also called a server in a different context. In our context by server I mean the process which is giving the service. So this is some kind of process which is uh, running in a particular machine. <coughs> Now, what might happen is that in, a, in the non-concurrent case, what will happen is that all the user requests come and they are sort of queued up, they are sort of put in a queue and what the server process, what it will do is that it will take out one from the queue, requ um, process the service and then give it back uh, and then, then send the result, then take the next one out of the queue. So there is a queue where all the processes uh, that means all the uh, client requests are waiting and the server that means the service uh, process which is giving the service this is taking one um, request at a time out of the queue. This is called a non-concurrent server, non-concurrent in the sense that of, uh, I mean of course when uh, you are using an UDP kind of you are using SOC DGRAM that means UDP kind of service that means it is a one off kind of service that means you get a request, send a message and maybe that is the end of the service. In that case this uh, non-concurrent server <coughs> or these are also called iterative servers. So these iterative servers are more efficient. But it may also happen that a, a particular in a particular service the client server communication is for an extended period of time in which case one particular request may block all other requests for a unnecessarily long time. So what would uh, in that case uh, a concurrent server, the so called concurrent server may be uh, preferred. So in concurrent server what happens is uh, that um, the server as soon as it gets a request at the well known port, it immediately spawns uh, or forks. Uh, 